So welcome everybody. We're gonna give people a few more minutes to join us and then we'll get started. All right, I see that we have about 30 people joining us so far. It's about one minute after. Let's go ahead uh, and get started. Welcome everyone to Sharing Space, Balancing Public Access and Habitat uh, at the Palo Alto Horizontal Levee Pilot Project. I'm Samantha English. I'm a senior engineer with the city of Palo Alto and I'm the city's project manager for the Palo Alto Horizontal Levee Pilot Project. I'd like to start off by acknowledging a few items. First, I'd like to thank my project partners, the San Francisco Estuary Partnership and the Coastal Conservancy. I'd also like to recognize the design firm of Environmental Science Associates or ESA. This project is definitely a team effort and would not be where it is without their support and hard work. I'd also like to acknowledge that many, if not all of the locations discussed throughout this webinar are located on the ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush, Muwekma, and Tamian Ohlone peoples who continue to live and thrive here today. Thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, throughout the webinar, you can submit questions using the Q&A button in the lower middle area of your screen. Questions will be answered in the same chat box by the project team uh, and time permitted answered live by panelists. Today, we hope to share updates on the progress of the Palo Alto Horizontal Levy pilot project, as well as share lessons learned from designers, researchers, and resource managers on how best to achieve habitat and public access goals. As such today, You'll hear presentations from myself and Dr. Peter Bay on the project details. Then you'll hear from experts in the field, including Supervising Ranger Lisa Myers, Mr. Lee Ho, Dr. Lynn Trulio, and Mr. Philip Higgins. Before we dive into the presentations, I'm going to hand it over to Heidi Nutters with the San Francisco Estuary Partnership to get us thinking about these topics with a few icebreakers. Heidi, would you like to take it away? Hi, Sam. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch to my screen um, in just a minute here, and we will get started. So this is a um, tool called Poll Everywhere, and there are multiple ways that you can participate in it. The first is by web. You can use your browser, your, your phone, a tablet, um, just anything that has a browser on it and go to the website polev.com um, and it will ask you to enter a code and you enter Clean Bay 989 um, and then it will give you the prompt for the question that Sam's going to explain in a moment. And the other way you can access it is by text. Um, you text to 22333 on your, you know, phone or other device. Um, and similarly, you know, it will give you a prompt um, after you enter the code clean bay 989. Um, so feel free to let us know if you have any um, issues with that. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Sam to walk us through the questions. All right. Thank you, Heidi. So the first question is, what are important elements of public access to the Palo Alto Baylands to you? Um, if you can limit your response to one word response, that helps with the word cloud. Um, and as you start submitting those responses, they should start popping up on the screen um, and hopefully indicate what just what that means to you. What does public access mean to you? So I see biking, birds, Habitat, trails. Wildlife safe trail. 
biodiversity, calmness. That's a nice one. Walks, safe, yeah. Maintenance, definitely true. Access, stewardship. Oh, beauty, that's a great one. Quiet, nature. All right. See, it looks like we're getting a few more in protection, width, conservation. Great. Those are all great answers. Thank you. All right, Heidi, do we want to move on to the next one? Oh, reflection. We got some. Oh, protection. We're getting some great, like last minute ones in there. <laughs> all right. So, our next icebreaker is what does habitat enhancement mean to you? Uh, again, if you can limit it to one word responses, it looked like we were able to squeeze two words in there as well. Um, but uh, uh, beyond that gets a little bit difficult. So what does habitat enhancement mean to you? Balance, plants, biodiversity, ooh, protection is a big one. Balance, that's a great one. healthy, natives, endangered. Oh, expand, improve, okay, sacred. Interpretation. Wow, I love this one. Improve, sustain, healthy. It's great. All right, I think we've gotten most, if not all, of the answers. Thank you all. Let's do one more question, Heidi. All right, so this is similar to public access, um, but I would love to hear from you about what are elements of social infrastructure to you? So when, when you hear the word social infrastructure, what does that mean to you? Um, is it a question? Is it um, trails? Is it access? What is social infrastructure to you? Responsible amenities, outreach, people, that's a great one. Benches, community, yeah. Education is so great. Enjoyment. Network, wow, these are great buzzwords. Respect, stewardship, conversations, this is great. Thank you so much for sharing and participating. All right, Heidi, I, I think we have gotten most, if not all. All right, let me share my screen again. Oh, wait. I may have shared too much. One second. Okay, can people see my screen? Can I get a thumbs up from a panelist? 
Thank you, Peter. All right, so thank you all for participating in the icebreaker. It was nice to kind of warm up our thoughts on the topic of public access and, and habitat enhancement, because we're going to start diving into that topic pretty deep today with the rest of the webinar. So thank you all for participating. <clears throat> So at this point, uh, I'm gonna present an overview of the Palo Alto Horizontal Levy pilot project. And as a quick reminder, questions can be submitted any time throughout the webinar. All you have to do is uh, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type them in. And um, panelists and the project team will be trying to answer them uh, through that same process, like in text. Uh, and if there's time permitted, we'll uh, try and answer some key questions live during the webinar. So the Palo Alto Horizontal Levy pilot project is sited in the pink area on this figure. It's situated within the Palo Alto Baylands and adjacent to the regional water quality control plant the Palo Alto Airport, Bigsby Park, the Palo Alto Flood Basin, and a large public access trail network. <clears throat> so what is a horizontal levee? <laughs> a horizontal levee um, is a gently sloping vegetated berm or ecotone slope that is on the water side of a flood control basin or flood control levee, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, a horizontal levee is shown in this figure in the circled red area. Um, and because the traditional freshwater connections throughout our region have been channelized for flood control, horizontal levees require a freshwater source. So for this project, that would be treated wastewater. So a horizontal levee is a green infrastructure alternative to traditional grayscape solutions for wave attenuation. So here in this slide, you see a picture on the left of what we call riprap. So these are large boulders on the bay side of a flood control levee that are used to um, attenuate web energy before it starts to hit the levee core and eat away at it. An alternative to these large boulders are horizontal levees. On the right, you see Oraloma Horizontal Levee Research Site. Um, it's very green, it's a very gentle slope, uh, but it still provides that wave attenuation that's needed to protect that flood control levee. In addition to that wave att attenuation, it also provides habitat enhancement benefits, including transitional habitat uh, between terrestrial and tidal marshes, high tide refugia. It recreates that historic freshwater seep that has been uh, channelized throughout our area. It also helps uh, with sea level rise adaptation. So it will attenuate wave energy, just like I had mentioned previously. It'll also accrete sediment uh, and accumulate that over time so that marshes can uh, adapt and move with sea level rise. Um, it also provides wastewater polishing treatment benefits, uh, particularly for nutrients and contaminants of emerging concern. So I do wanna pause and just state that um, the Regional Water Quality Control Plant does an excellent job of treating wastewater before it's discharged to the Lower South Bay. It meets all its permits limits, and this project would not um, be needed to help meet those permit limits. But this project would be um, above and beyond all of that great treatment that already is occurring at the wastewater treatment plant. So it's considered polishing treatment. So it's, it's additional treatment beyond that already being received or being conducted. So the Palo Alto Horizontal Levy Pilot Project has numerous goals. Uh, it's a pilot project. Uh, so the concept is that we are going to construct a horizontal levee within the Palo Alto Baylands in a small area. And in that small area, we want to collect information on permitting and implementation of horizontal levees within Palo Alto. What we're trying to do is extend that information that's been already learned from the Oraloma Horizontal Levee Research Site by connecting this system to tidal action in the Bay. We're also looking to collect that information and integrate it into uh, the design elements for larger flood control levy improvement projects that are currently in the works or currently in design. 
And these projects include Safer Bay and the South San Francisco Bay Shoreline Study Phase Two. With this project, we're also looking to enhance the quality of the existing habitat at that project site. Um, I'll go into this a little bit further and Dr. Peter Bay will as well, um, but you'll see that the existing conditions at the site are in need of habitat enhancement. They need to be improved. At the same time, we need to maintain the existing level of social infrastructure and public access that currently exists at the location. So here's an aerial view of the project location. The project is cited to be on the brownish area circled in red in this figure. It currently has a publicly accessible trail that you can see as a stark white line, essentially acting as the boundary between what is currently poor quality upland habitat shown in brown and good quality wetland habitat shown in the greenish hues. If you've been following the project, you'll note that this is a new location from what was previously evaluated. The previous location was further north, adjacent to the Palo Alto airport. Uh, and during preliminary design, it was determined to be too close to the airport runway um, and approach to the runway. Uh, so we moved it further south uh, to the location shown in red in the hopes uh, that we would reduce FAA concerns about safety and um, increased bird strikes in particular. So here's a photo of the current conditions at the project site. You can just make out the public access trail in white peeking through that dry brush in the middle left-hand side of the photo. This is an area that is currently uh, poor habitat quality and has been identified in the Palo Alto Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Master Plan as in need of habitat restoration and improvement. Supervising Ranger Lisa Myers will be providing additional information shortly on the Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Master Plan, as well as the Palo Alto Baylands at large. And sooner than that, uh, Dr. Peter Bay will be providing much more detail on the current habitat quality at this project site uh, and the planned enhancements for this project site as well. Before he can dive into those details, I'm gonna try and give you an, an overview so that those details make a little bit more sense um, and are in a little bit more context. So here's a schematic of the uh, project site. Uh, and this one is, this particular schematic is showing the different habitats that we are trying to create and enhance at the project site. Um, so you'll notice that there's kind of a varying, uh, there's varying shades of gray and some brown in there. Um, and that's because we're seeking to uh, enhance the current habitat to include a range or a diverse set of habitats, including freshwater wet meadow and upland scrub. So one of the project goals is to provide transitional and refugia habitat for species such as the salt marsh harvest mouse and Ridgeway rail. And with providing these diverse subsets, we're hoping to do just that. We're also seeking to move the current public access trail from its current location on the bay margin to a spot closer to Embarcadero Road, and yet still providing a connection to that larger trail network that's in the area. So the proposed trail location is shown in this figure as the dark brown, <clears throat> excuse me, the dark brown line um, that you can see that's closer to the road. <clears throat> excuse me one second. And then in this figure, you can see the current trail that's kind of peeking out again as white in the background graphic. Here's a profile of an area of the project site. Going from left to right uh, on the profile, you'll see that the horizontal levee is going to consist of a small berm with a public access trail on top, followed by a gentle slope that contains a subsurface treatment area irrigated by treated wastewater and then contains a diverse vegetated habitat on the surface. It would then transition and connect to the existing tidal wetland that would be essentially off this page um, on the right-hand side. Next steps for the project. Um, we are seeking to continue to collaborate with the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. We are currently progressing the design to a 60% project definition and we're hoping to finish that up before the end of this year might bleed into um, early 2022. 
Then shortly after that, <clears throat> we're looking to uh, conduct permitting, CEQA, and finish up the final design with the hopes of finishing all of that in 2022 and starting construction in 2023. If you want more information on the project details, we have two project websites, one um, hosted by the City of Palo Alto and one hosted by the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. And both are listed on the screen for you um, to look at later. Uh, if you so desire. So before we transition to the next speaker, I just wanna remind everybody that questions can be submitted through the Q&A button. Um, I do see that at least a few have been coming in while I've been talking, um, but I do just wanna put that out there and I'll be reminding everybody throughout this presentation that if you have questions, please feel free to submit them uh, through that button. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Peter Bay. Dr. Peter Bay is a coastal ecologist and botanist with a lifelong focus on coastal beaches, dunes, tidal marshes, lagoons, and their connections to adjacent marine, estuarine, and terrestrial ecosystems. He has worked on planning, restoring, managing, and regulating San Francisco Bay shorelines and wetlands for over 30 years. He formerly worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He has worked for an independent ecological, or sorry, he has worked as an independent ecological and botanical consultant for the last 20 years, serving nonprofit conservation organizations, state and federal resource agencies in planning and implementation of coastal ecosystem restoration projects and management plans. His recent coastal adaptation projects have focused on innovations for increasing ecosystem resilience to sea level rise and climate change. Welcome. Dr. Peter Bay. Thanks. Um, I hope my internet connection is going to be stable throughout this. Let me know if it's, it's not. Um, I'd like to um, walk everyone through the uh, uh, site and uh, its setting in Palo Alto Baylands, particularly the, the adjacent Harbor Marsh, as a way of introducing the um, origin and the logic behind the ecological objectives for the horizontal levee. Horizontal levees um, are sort of a, a generalized concept, but for their design, you need to fit them to their local environments. Uh, by definition, a, a, a horizontal levee is supposed to be an ecotone or transition zone, which means it has to relate to the two adjacent ecosystems, one terrestrial and one estuarine. And no, no two estuarine shorelines in San Francisco Bay are exactly alike. They all have their own idiosyncrasies. So I'd like to dive in a little bit and show you what I saw and how it led to some of the, um, the nuances of the um, horizontal levee design here. So first slide. Well, let's start with the terrestrial end of the ecotone. Um, this is the existing or uh, the, the most recent condition that, that um, I reviewed before we started the designing. This is about uh, 2017 or so. Uh, these are some of the upland bayfill flats. Of course, the original habitats here were all lowland uh, seasonal wetlands and willow scrub um, riparian wetlands. These were all filled um, and reclaimed for agriculture decades, ago, well, century, over a century ago. Um, and more recently, um, with post-World War II industrial fills, um, the, the, this area became filled with a mix of bay mud and miscellaneous um, upland fill. And the dominant vegetation is weedy, mostly Mediterranean and Asian um, annual grasses and forbs, some of which are somewhat salt tolerant. We actually get some salt marsh weeds in the uplands here. And, uh, just a typical array of, of um, weedy roadside and bayland um, vegetation you see elsewhere in the South Bay, including fennel, ripgut brome, um, sometimes Mediterranean saltwort, uh, and a few traces of, of uh, alkali heat. There are some natives in here, but generally it's a fairly widespread, um, uh, high non-native diversity, but low native diversity uh, terrestrial flat. Next slide. And here's another view. You can see also the um, management keeps the area mown um, uh, for many reasons, both for public access and for um, visibility, fire risk. So um, the uh, summer mowing also uh, restricts the range of vegetation types. There are some unmown areas where there's um, coyote brush scrub. Coyote brush isn't a natural dominant species. It's more of an opportunist that 
comes in and colonizes mostly disturbed fill areas. It's pretty, pretty widespread in the day. And there are some traces, some local pockets of uh, native vegetation, which I'll zoom in in. Next slide. Um, here's that broad plain again. The, uh, it's even though the native plant species diversity uh, may be low, this can be an important habitat for um, wildlife. Um, there are um, studies of wildlife from the adjacent Bixby Park, uh, a capped landfill, which has similar grass and habitats. And of course, uh, wildlife don't restrict their locations like plants, they're not sessile, so they're moving across the upland portions of the landscape. So it's presumed that most of the wildlife that have been recorded at Bix Bixby Park are also moving through the Palo Alto Baleen Flats. And you can actually see evidence of this by the trail network, not the human trail network, but the subtle um, tracks and trails that, that um, form sort of a reticulate web-like network in the vegetation where animal trampling follows consistent patterns. And uh, coyote, skunk, um, uh, uh, fox, uh, jackrabbits, the, the, the whole suite of urban edge um, mammalian uh, predators and herbivores are, are present here. Um, I understand there were, someone mentioned in chat that there were previously larger ground squirrel populations than there are now. That also may have something to do with the landfill. I think um, uh, ground squirrels may be um, subject to control in some areas where there are uh, landfill caps. Um, I don't know if that's the case here. There were formerly burrowing owls up to 2005 in Bixby Park, and this is generally the kind of habitat that I, I would welcome Lynn Trulio talking more about. So it's, it's even though it is degraded upland, um, lowland, actually, uh, topographic lowland habitat, it's not insignificant for wildlife. So we are working with a pre-existing um, wildlife community here. Next slide. And here is one example of one of the remnant communities. It probably is not remnant to exactly this location since the whole area was filled, but this is a stand of one of the dominant native seasonal wet meadow grasses. It's uh, alkali um, wild rye or creeping wild rye, Linus triticoides, and it's sort of like, I think of it as um, the equivalent of cord grass for uplands, just as cord grass is one of the natural dominant species in uh, tidal marshes, creeping wild rye is one of the dominant native lowland terrestrial species for um, not hill slope grasslands, not the ones that uh, are we, we normally associate with bunch grass ecosystems, but the lowland valleys and flats that bordered the bay. This is one of the dominant species, not exclusively dominant, but it's reestablished a, a large clonal patch, meaning that uh, it spreads by rhizome and it forms large uh, single dominant or sometimes single species consolidated stands, just as cordgrass does in, in uh, tidal marshes. And it found its way back to its, the site, um, probably from local remnant populations, and it's occupying some swales here. Um, this is significant because we'll probably be using this species. It's, it is one of the species that was included in the Oraloma pilot project design, and um, it has a, a natural place in the community. And the fact that it's still here shows you that we are looking at picking up pieces of relic pieces of a former ecosystem here and reassembling them. And we would probably be uh, salvaging and recycling uh, this, this species and putting it in uh, uh, an environment to which it's better adapted. Uh, next slide. And uh, here's an example of that mammal track. You can see that the tall, dense cover of the native uh, creeping wild rye is providing a preferred uh, uh, animal track or pathway through it. Um, the tall, dense cover also is enhanced by increased shallow groundwater or surface moisture. So if the, the Palo Alto pilot project provides um, artificially sub-irrigated groundwater to this kind of stand, which I think illustrates one of the wet meadow habitat types we're, we're, that we're planning for um, the, the horizontal levee, you could expect the density and height of this kind of native grassland stand to be substantially increased. And as the cover increases, so do some of the ecosystem functions. Right now, it's probably not sparse, it's probably too sparse, not dense enough to support functions like mallard nesting. But um, uh, when creeping wild rye stands develop thick litter mats and tall vegetation, 
Mallards often do nest next to San Francisco Bay where there are freshwater sources. In fact, we just found one at the Oroloma Marsh, not the Oroloma Horizontal Levee Project, uh, East Bay Regional Parks, found a native remnant stand of this species, and I almost stepped on a, a mallard nest. Uh, they, were, they were using that as cover. Next slide. That's actually one of the goals I, I'm hoping we're able to uh, uh, apply here. It's more, more aspiration, but if we could get nesting birds in some of the uh, wet meadows here, that'd be great. Here, okay, now I'm going to jump down to the, the lowland area, sorry, the, the below the lowlands into the tidal marshes to show the linkages between um, the terrestrial and the estuarine environment. I'm going to focus on a few things that stand out to me as significant. We're now looking at what would be called mud flats, but as you can see, the surface cover here isn't really very muddy. It has this almost moss-like dense dark cover, which shows one, that there's not a whole lot of bay mud depositing in the summertime, at least, on the surfaces of these flats. It's also erosional at the edges. Um, of these small uh, channels or rills. This is, these are cyanobacterial gnats. They're blue-green so-called algae. They're not really algae. And what's significant is that they usually are associated with areas of very reduced iron that upwells from subsurface. So this is a possible indicator that there are groundwater, sh shallow groundwater seeps upwelling dissolved iron and sulfide from deeper muds here. And this by itself wouldn't be diagnostic, but it's a, a, the first clue that there are some current hydrologic connections between the uplands and the, 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 the estuarine environment, which is exactly the premise of a horizontal levee. Next slide. Still on this slide. <laughs> Uh, the cordgrass present here uh, is probably a mix of hybrid cordgrass, which is difficult to, um, uh, Samantha, I'm still on the same slide, at least on my computer. Ah, thanks. Uh, this, this sea of cordgrass is a mix of um, probably non-native hybrid cordgrass. It's um, difficult to eradicate it all at once without harming the Ridgeway's rail populations, I'll mention in, in a moment. Uh, there's a, a decent number of Ridgeway's rail populations here. Um, you can see the darker vegetation in this sea of cordgrass is actually a contrasting species, and this is also a significant potential indicator of subsurface hydrology connections to terrestrial groundwater upwelling. That dark zone is alkali bulrush, Bulbuscinus meridimus. It's normally associated with brackish marshes in the North Bay, where there are natural streams that flow out to the bay or seeps groundwater emergence at the edges of tidal marshes. It's also associated with um, larger wastewater outflows that dilute bay salinity. But here we don't have any direct discharges to dilute the bay. So these, these are these large patches which are really robust and perennial. They're always in the same positions. It looks like we may be having um, sort of like artesian springs or seeps coming from deeper terrestrial groundwater emerging from um, from below the tidal marsh. And this is significant because the discharges from the horizontal levee would add to whatever this baseline is. So where you see alkali bulrush, you're looking at the probable um, connection to additional freshwater upwelling into the marsh. You're also looking at a source of high tide refuge because alkali bulrush provides stiff, upright, taller um, vegetative cover that persists all winter and um, that's important for conserving marsh wildlife from uh, uh, sheltering them from predators, particularly avian predators during extreme high tides in winter. So these are important habitat elements. Next slide. And here's another surprising condition we found uh, looking at the tidal marshes at the edge of the project site. Um, this is also alkali bulrush growing in salt marsh. Um, again, a brackish marsh indicator, and here it's growing actually at the edge of the high marsh by the Lambert Edge in the transition zone. This is, normally would be an area where things get saltier because the elevations pick up and there's more summer evaporation. So the fact that there are sparse stands of alkali bulrus suggests that there is already some seepage or leakage from those, those um, upland flats are acting like a sponge probably because there's more permeable substrate like sands or gravels in the imported fill, it more easily leaks out into the bay. So you're seeing one of the processes that a horizontal levee is 
uh, aimed at improving or uh, enhancing, it is occurring at a, uh, to a small extent even now. But what's particularly significant is that one of the target species for um, enhancing in a tidal marsh, alkali bulrush, to create a wide zone at the edge of the salt marsh for high tide refuge and dense wave attenuating stands of vegetation, they're already present. They don't need to be planted or imported. It's not going to be exotic to the system. It's just occurring at a very low level. Next slide. Slide. We'll see. Oh yes, here's a side uh, lateral view of the um, that alkali bulrush stand. You can see it's actually almost climbing up into the uplands next to the upland rural weed species like fennel and oats. Um, you can also see that there is. It's really hard to call this a transition zone. You can see that the edge between upland and tidal marsh is very abrupt. It's not a gradual transition. It's pretty much the edge of where fill was dumped and settled. So it's a one-to-one -one or two-to-one slope. It's you know poorly sorted um, heterogeneous fill that brought a weed flora with it. So there's an abrupt edge between weedy upland vegetation and tidal marsh. This is quite the opposite of what a horizontal levy would do. We, horizontal levy would be aiming at spreading this slope out to be a closer approximation of an alluvial fan or a delta, gentle slopes with a broad transition, almost imperceptible between uh, tidal salt marsh, a brackish marsh zone in the inner salt marsh, and then uh, a wet meadow or, or a wetland, freshwater wetland swale. Um, and next slide. Here's another view of that, that transition zone. You can see it's really hardly a transition zone at all. There's a dis you can see just visually, there's a very distinct break between the relatively homogeneous tidal salt marsh plain, a, a discontinuous break in what would we normally call the transition zone, where the species switch over to kind of a mosaic of alkali heath, pickleweed, salt grass, um, and a, a little bit of gum plant. There's not much gum plant in, in the edge. But it's a very discrete break. You can see it visually. And then there's a discrete break to um, the upland coyote brush scrub and upland weeds. So hardly even a transition zone there now. We've kind of retained the term, but the meaning is kind of lost here. This is this is the product of you know unregulated fill prior to BCDC in the 1950s uh, and possibly early 60s. Next slide. And here's another um, wildlife management aspect of the current site. Uh, you can see that there's a public trail within two meters or so of the very abrupt steep salt marsh edge. You can see the transition zone is really in quotes here. <laughs> there is virtually none. It's a very sharp, sharp edge. It's really not visible when shadows are cast by the vegetation. And you can see that human traffic and of course at nighttime wildlife use trails too um, they're right up by, by the edge of the tidal marsh. You can imagine this during an extreme high tide in winter when marsh wildlife are flooded off the marsh, there is really no persistent cover for them to reach at the edge of the marsh. The tides go right to the edge of that sparse annual cover. The annual cover in winter is negligible. And of course, if people are walking or animals are walking along the trail, um, there's predator corridors right next to the bare salt marsh with almost no buffer or transition zone. So this, there's no place to go but up in terms of habitat design here. This is, this is one thing, a, a horizontal levee with a, a broad slope with a tall vegetative edge of, of alkali bulrush would really change. It would bring in um, uh, dense cover that would attenuate wind wave energy from the deeply submerged tidal marsh, and it would provide uh, very tall uh, continuous stands of alkali bulrush, which would be very easy for any marsh wildlife to disappear into or climb, such as uh, you know, small mammals like mice. They, they move up stems and remain under cover. Next slide. And here, here's a, an overview. Uh, you can see the sharp edge of the upland fill. Here it's casting the shadow. Virtually no meaningful transition zone. The bright line of the uh, 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 public trail right at the tidal marsh edge, providing zero buffer. 
And you can see also where um, Ridgeways rails um, might travel at the edges of tidal marsh channels and these smaller sinuous channels along the, the, uh, the marsh edge. You can also see these darker patches in the tidal marsh. Those are the alkali bulrush patches, which are very consistent in their overall pattern and size and distribution among many years, drought and wet years. And those also provide um, uh, areas of enhanced high tide cover, but somewhat more distant from the shoreline. And the horizontal levee would then pr produce that tall cover um, edge, uh, the brackish marsh zone edge, that would link up with these discrete um, alkali bulrush patches in the marsh, some of which are associated with um, Ridgeways rail territories. Next slide. And here's just another view from the previous year, drought year. You can see the graying out of the pickleweed marsh during the extreme drought. But notice that the alkali bulrush patterns are pretty consistent. That suggests that they're being supported even in drought years from, from uh, uh, diluted salinity that is not coming from the bay. That's probably coming from underneath. Next slide. So the horizontal levee would pretty much be in the outline of where you saw the, the white path. And here's just to close up, we do have um, an existing population of Ridgeways rails in the Palo Alto Baylands. Um, the uh, numbers are, are significant. Um, there, there's probably well, estimated 15 to 19 rails um, between um, the Harbor Marsh and Hooks Island. And um, we don't know how many salt marsh harvest mice there are, if any are still present. There are areas of, of continuous habitat. But uh, whether they're occupied or not, um, I'm not sure what the current status is. We also have drift lines that provide rich uh, sources of invertebrate prey for salt marsh wandering shrews. Again, population status is unknown. But all of these species would depend on a balance between interior high tide refuge in the marsh as flood refuges and during the most extreme tides, um, landward edge flood refugia that are available when the entire marsh plain is submerged or nearly submerged. Next slide. And there is also, just to close up on that um, little obsession about alkali bulrush, it is an important and unexpected species for this part of the South Bay. Um, some of the uh, Ridgeways rail um, uh, territories um, are actually associated with the um, alkali, a few of the, at least three of the alkali bulrush patches, the majority of the rail detections, however, are clustered in the interior of Harbor Marsh, where you'd expect them. Um, that They tend to associate with the edges of channels and areas of high tidal channel density, and usually in areas where there is uh, nearby high tide cover along levee banks, uh, 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 sorry, natural levee banks along the edges of tidal channels. And last slide, I think. Um, so even though most of the rails are well away from the project site towards the marsh interior, there is a potential for some of the um, rail uh, home ranges or territories to expand and make use of the vegetation changes expected from the horizontal levee. So at least three of uh, the 14 or 15 territories that ESA um, uh, detected in their 2020 rail survey were in or around uh, map, mapped uh, alkali bulrush patches, the ones I just showed you. So there is some possibility of enhancing portion of that rail population, uh, the habitat conditions for them um, near the project site. And I probably run on a little too long, so I'm gonna close off there. Maybe questions later. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Bay. Uh, so I'm looking at um, the questions that have been submitted so far, um, and we've been able to answer most of them offline. Um, and I think we have time for maybe one question to be answered live right now. Um, and I think one of the ones that may be interesting to hear most from you on is since the pilot project, um, since the project is a pilot, um, any idea on when it could be applied to the whole shoreline? Any idea of when we could be expecting data um, to be collected through the pilot project that we could then uh, apply to the larger projects? Um, well, I, I don't know exactly till we start getting <laughs> initial results, but um, the Oraloma um, pilot project um, developed vegetation a lot faster than anyone expected. We set sort of objectives for five years. 
but I think wildlife colonization of the site and uh, near complete cover by native vegetation occurred um, within two years. So uh, I do expect we may have, we probably should uh, plan on getting a monitoring program up and running pretty soon after construction. <laughs> it's, it's a rapid, been a rapid response so far. And that's not really un, unexpected for freshwater dominated systems. They, they tend to colonize rapidly and there's a practical reason for that. If you don't establish the target vegetation rapidly, weeds do. <laughs> so uh, it's a good thing that they're, they're very aggressive, that some of our native freshwater species are also very aggressive colonizers. And uh, wildlife, as you saw, there's plenty of wildlife in the, air, the vicinity, and they will probably make rapid use of that uh, enhanced cover and food sources. Definitely. Thank you so much. All right. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Supervising Ranger Lisa Myers. Um, but before I do, please, if you have any questions that pop into your head um, throughout the other presenters that may be specific to um, earlier presenters, please feel free to submit them and we can uh, bring them back online towards the end of um, all the presentations. All right, so Supervising Ranger Lisa Myers has worked for the City of Palo Alto in open space for 23 years and is currently the Supervising Ranger for the Palo Alto Baylands. She has also worked in Southern California for Caltrans as an environmental planner for the California Department of Parks and Recreation, as a seasonal park aide and state park ranger. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in environmental studies with an emphasis in marine resource management. And she completed her coursework at San Jose State as well as uh, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. So please welcome Lisa Myers. Good morning. Um, so I'm here to give you a brief overview of the uh, Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Plan. Um, it's a over 170 page document, so I can't get into great detail here. Um, so next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the BCCP, Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Plan, goes over a whole variety of goals. So the first of them, of course, is gonna be our natural resources management. Um, we're looking to maintain, protect, and preserve existing functioning native habitats, eco ecosystem functions, and wildlife corridors. Um, we're looking to manage the baylands as a habitat for native species and the preservation of biodiversity, as well as enhancing and restoring degraded habitats and habitat corridors, and protect and enhance hydrologic connectivity. Next slide. Sea level rise, that's why we're here today. Um, the BCCP looks to incorporate climate change and sea level rise into long-term management policies. As you can see here, we have some rangers who are installing sandbags um, in an area where we know that we have uh, a levee that's not high enough. Um, and you can see where we have uh, flooding during one of the king tides. Um, I believe that this was 2005. Next slide. Uh, public access and facilities. So uh, we're here to provide opportunities for recreation and access via a habitat compatible trail network and to enable uh, wildlife observation uh, and ensure that future generations develop an appreciation for wildlife, other wildlife compatible recreational activities and connections to the greater Palo Alto area. Um, we're doing that via uh, identifying and developing recommendations for connection points for trails to the greater Palo Alto area, identify areas for wildlife observation that will limit disturbance to habitats and wildlife, such as areas near existing infrastructure, including roads and parking lots, and provide appropriate facilities for uh, visitors to the Baylands, uh, identify appropriate locations for facilities and park amenities, such as parking, restrooms, benches, and water fountains. Next slide, please. The Palo Alto Airport. So some of the goals with that are to promote ecologically sensitive uh, policies for areas at and near the Palo Alto Airport, um, coordinate projects and planning efforts with the airport management staff to align with the city's federal obligations of operating a public use airport as well as collaborate with the airport management to promote safety and implement wildlife management measures near the runways. Next slide, please. 
public engagement. Um, one of the goal, the, the main goal is to provide um, and promote thoughtful, well-advertised and transparent community involvement opportunities that encourage participation by partner organizations, community groups and environmental education programs to foster greater uh, public engagement in the Baylands. And you can see here, um, we have uh, two of the three photos are um, the environmental volunteers and Save the Bay who are two of our really big partners out here at the Baylands. Next slide, please. Public art, uh, Bixby Art Park uh, has quite a bit of uh, art that's still left out here after the, uh, the landfill was re recapped. Um, we still have the wind wave sculpture. Uh, we still have uh, the chevrons uh, and the pole field. In addition to that, since the capping, we've added in um, the foraging island, uh, which is a temporary art uh, piece. Um, so the goal is to include appropriate environmental art in the Baylands that builds on Palo Alto's public art master plan. Next slide, please. Management. Um, so the goal here is to holistically manage the Baylands to strike the appropriate balance between recreation and natural resource protection and ensure that existing and proposed activities are compatible with ecological and physical constraints. Next slide, please. Uh, projects. The goal here is to strategically phase the projects within the Baylands to minimize disturbance to wildlife and visitor use. The projects that we have um, shown here in this slide are, um, of course, the recently installed Baylands Boardwalk uh, that goes out from the Baylands Nature Interpretive Center, the upcoming uh, Tidegate pro replacement project, um, and then the uh, down below shows the realignment of uh, San Francisco Creek, as well as the uh, Baylands bike overcrossing that is just about to open this weekend. Next slide, please. Invasive species, park rangers spend an awful lot of time dealing with invasive species out here. Um, so the goals here are to reduce the extent of invasive species in the Baylands by creating a methodology for determining which invasive, spe which invasive weeds should be prioritized for removal, identify locations where invasive weeds should be prioritized for removal, as well as implementing an early detection eradication system develop and implement a monitoring system to track long-term effectiveness and create and enhance an integrated pest management approach to incorporate best available science. Next slide, please. <clears throat> For uh, Bixby Park, the goals are to finalize the 2015 interim Bixby Park master plan, which includes guidance for the completion of interpretive signage, incorporates policies for appropriate management of wildlife and native habitats. Contain, it contains plans for trail connections to the former ITT property, as well as the Emily Renza wetlands and completes plans for a parking lot at Bixby Park. Um, with that, we would wanna develop, uh, we're working on developing a parking design for Bixby Park, um, create methodology for determining which invasive weeds should be prioritized for removal, identify and develop recommendations for potential trail connections to the former ITT property and Emily Renzel wetlands, identify opportunities for additional locations to expand the habitat islands, as well as determine the feasibility of opportunities to include burrowing owl habitat in Bixby Park. Next slide, please. The former ITT property and the Emily and Renzel wetlands um, restore, protect, and enhance wetlands, uplands, and hydrologic connectivity to the site. Develop a plan for potentially uh, historic building at the former uh, ITT property. Identify and maintain existing function and habitats. Identify the location of potential trails and connections that promote habitat compatible access to the site that maintains important ecological processes and functions. Um, develop use alternatives for the potentially historic building at the ITT property, uh, as well as identify and develop recommendations for trail connections from the former ITT property and the Emily Renzel 
uh, as well as other parts of the Baylands, and then incorporate current projects at the Emily Renzel uh, wetlands into future planning and site design. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for a full draft of the, the BCCP, you can visit the city's website. The easiest thing to do is to go to cityofpaloalto.org and type in Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Plan. Um, this page will come up for you um, and it will give you the full current draft version of the BCCP. Um, we're working on getting the BCCP draft through environmental and hopefully I believe we should be done with that in short order. I'm not sure what our, our final date's gonna be for that. Um, next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of an idea about Palo Alto Open Space and what we do, um, Palo Alto Open Space is comprised of four open space nature preserves that cover about 4,000 acres. Um, the Baylands, of course, Foothills Park, which everyone's very familiar with these days. Um, Pearson Arastradero, and uh, Esther Clark Park, which is just a 22 acre little, little pocket park that's located um, in Los Altos. Next slide, please. Um, we have some amazing partner groups that we work with. Grassroots Ecology, Save the Bay and the Environmental Volunteers. Next slide, please. So to give you an idea of the Bayland statistics for how we do it all out here, um, we have one supervising ranger, that's me. Normally we have two full-time rangers down here. Um, for the last year or so, we've only had one full-time ranger down here um, because we uh, needed to reallocate staffing up to Foothills Park for the opening up there. It's 1,940 acres of uh, open space nature preserve down here at the Baylands. Um, we have 15 miles of trails across two counties and give or take, uh, on an average year, we get somewhere in the neighborhood of about 700,000 visitors per year just at the Palo Alto Baylands. And the little building depicted there is the Baylands Ranger Station, um, which is where we make it all happen. Next slide, please. Um, to give you an idea of some of the things that we do uh, as rangers, we are what are known as full service or generalist rangers. So we do emergency response for anything from an airplane crash down here in the Baylands to a grass fire at, uh, I believe that one was at the dish property, um, down trees, uh, car accidents up on Upper Page Mill Road, uh, mud rescues down here at the Baylands. Next slide, please. We do quite a bit of maintenance. And as you can see, we use a a variety of tractors in a variety of ways. Um, we do everything from um, installing interpretive panels to uh, resurfacing roads. We build, construct, design, um, anything that needs to happen out here um, that's from a park standpoint, we take care of. Um, we do occasionally use contractors down here for a few things here and there, but the work mostly is done um, by open space staff. Next slide, please. Um, we have in the past done quite a bit of interpretation and resource management because of our staffing um, over the last year and a half, two years, um, we've had to drop down the amount of interpretation that we do. Um, and we're not doing quite as many resource management uh, projects. Uh, a lot of those, a lot of that is partly due to staffing levels. It's additionally uh, with all the COVID restrictions that we've had. Next slide, please. And there you go, a nice, bay, a nice Bayland sunrise. Thank you so much, Lisa. Sure. That was very informative. So I, I've been looking through the Q&A submitted so far, um, and I think I'm going to ask you a selfish question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so of the 700,000 visitors per year, uh, do we have a sense of where those visitors come from? Are they, are they mainly from Palo Alto? Are they from surrounding communities? Do they come from far and wide? It's, I would say probably 25% are Palo Alto residents. 50% um, is folks from the Bay Area in general. And then probably 25% are folks who are coming from all over the world. Wow. 
That's great. Thank you so much. All right. Next, I'd like to welcome Mr. Lee Huo. Lee is a senior planner working on the Bay Trail program at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. He has over 20 years of experience in Bay resources, shoreline trails, open space, and public access planning. He has worked with the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission and currently is a member of the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority's Advisory Committee. His interests focus on the successful melding of public access and restoration projects to ensure that generations of people will have the opportunity to experience and learn from the many restoration projects. Welcome, Lee. Thanks very much, Samantha. Appreciate that. Um, I know we're quite behind, so I'm going to try to abbreviate in places where I can. Um, again, I'm with the Baytro program that is a program of the Association of Bay Area Governments and work for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission just to make it that much more complicated. I don't know how things work. Next. So I thought I'd start out with an overview of what the Bay Trail and what the Bay Trail vision is so that I can provide some context to um, why we have the idea of public access along the shoreline and also to provide context for the design guidelines I'm going to go through. So the, if you're not familiar with it, which I think a lot of people probably are if you're from the Bay Area, it's the idea of a 500 mile continuous hiking and bicycling trail that's going to encircle the entire San Francisco Bay that connects the nine counties and 47 cities and crosses seven toll bridges when it's completed. Right now, we're, we've got about 350 miles of it completed, which is just over 70 percent, and it crosses currently five and a half toll bridges. Next. So I also wanted to provide a little bit of a history of public access along the Bay. Uh, as you can see from this timeline, the idea of public access is not a new idea. Um, although it wasn't an idea when people first moved into the Bay Area uh, for the gold rush, at least. Um, when the first people who moved into the Bay Area, uh, the Bay was seen as a place that you didn't want to be where it was where industry was located. It was where mosquitoes and marshlands were located and people didn't want to be there. They put trash dumps there. But in the 60s, like uh, many other ideas that came the concept of environmental uh, movement looked at ways to preserve the Bay. And as a result of that, with a lot of different groups and probably one of the biggest players at the time in 1961 with the formation of Save the Bay, they all worked towards the creation of the McAteer Petrus Act, which is a state law in 1965 that created both the San Francisco Bay Conservation Development Commission uh, and also legislation that essentially required the state to minimize fill within the Bay and also provide public access along the shoreline. Essentially, the 60s were a time where people, instead of turning away from the bay, were turning back towards the bay. Flash, flash forward about 20 years, and another state legislation, Senate Bill 100, was created, which um, created the idea of the Bay Trail, essentially. Uh, it asked the Association of Bay Area Governments, ABAG, to create a plan to do that. And in 1989, uh, the Bay Trail plan was adopted and 30 years later in 2019, we had our 30th anniversary. Next. So just real briefly here, uh, the San Francisco Bay Trail project, the way it's organized, I think the main point I wanted to get across with this slide is that it does have a nonprofit associated, it has a board of directors, but also because of how big of an idea that the Bay Trail is, uh, for the longest time, Bay Trail only had three staff, essentially, for the entire region. It really is a partnership where the trail is created. It's a lot of public and private organizations. Uh, the responsibility really falls on a lot of the cities, counties, even state, federal uh, agencies, and special districts that really help plan for, uh, design, and build and manage the Bay Trail throughout the region. Next. And kind of related to that, um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that the Bay Trail, because it's been around for so long, has broad support throughout the region. There's been resolutions that have been provided by pretty much all of the cities and counties that it touches uh, that supports the idea of the Bay Trail and completing the vision. Next. 
So we're going to jump into design guidelines, but before I do that, I want to emphasize that the design guidelines were meant to uh, provide a palette of ideas and also to kind of get people to start thinking about how to design the trail and the many diverse spaces of the bay. Next. So getting a little bit more into the details, it's again, to with three staff, we wanted to be able to create a document that could speak for us and to allow anybody to pick up the, the document and have a good idea of what is the vision of the Bay Trail? What is the purpose of the Bay Trail to answer those questions? So then that they can think about um, how to design so that, um, how do you can plan design and build the trail so that it, it, it is, uh, fulfills the purpose of the Bay Trail and the principles and objectives associated with it to meet its vision. And also as part of this document, we want to illustrate a series of common uh, uh, design solutions and best practices for common design issues that we see quite often when people are trying to figure out how to put a trail along the Bay. And of course, we want to provoke thoughtful design through all of these uh, situations. Next. So this is an excerpt from the design guidelines. What I wanted to emphasize is on the right side of this page here is what I was mentioning earlier, that we tried to really develop these design guidelines so that anyone can read and understand it. Of course, the primary purpose is to target design teams, whether they're engineers, planners, or landscape architects, so that they can really get a strong sense of what the goals and vision of the Bay Trail is, so that that helps inform how they design it and the issues that are related to designing a trail along the Bay, which can be very complex sometimes. It's also to help inform our public agency partners and also, of course, our partners at BCDC. And lastly, and not least, uh, to, for the members of the public who are the ones who really support the Bay Trail and its completion on um, how we move ahead with this type of design so they can participate in the process as well whenever a project is moving forward. Next. So I'm not going to get into all the different design principles that the guideline goes through, but I wanted to kind of show this page to emphasize some of the points that we ask people to look at when they're looking at designing public access for the metro along the shoreline. First, of course, is user experience and safety. Um, how does it feel for people to go through there? Does it feel safe? Is it somewhere that they want to be? Is it attractive? Um, that kind of thing. And probably one of the most important concepts for the Bay Trail is the continuity and connectivity of the trail. The whole premise and the vision of the trail for Bay Trail is that it's going to be continuous and encircled the entire San Francisco Bay. So whenever we have a break, that, of course, is going to be an issue in the long run of completing the vision. Um, one of the other principles is what we call universal access. Um, what we mean by universal access is not only uh, um, ADA access for disabilities, but also the idea that a lot of bicyclists are using right now with the buzzword of providing a trail that is usable for all ages and abilities. The idea is we want to be as inclusive as possible in the design of the trail. Another emphasis, of course, with the concept of the Bay Trail is in the name itself is to be able to provide a Bay experience or proximity to the Bay. We also want to have people think about expected level of use, which basically translates the capacity. And when you're looking at trails, capacity translates to width. So we want people to think about not only how many people do they think will use the trail when they build it now, but also in the future and when the trail is completed. And this is, of course, the emphasis, the next one of why I'm here today is to talk about compatibility of wildlife, which I'll get into more details later. And as mentioned earlier by some other folks today, one of the, the foremost concepts we have to deal with and one of the purposes of this particular project is to see how we can adapt to sea level rise. Next. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the Bay Trail, because it goes through so much space in the entire Bay Area, you go through a lot of different spaces. Um, there's a lot of diversity in those types of spaces you go through and the type of design that you implement in those places are going to be different and specific for each one of those spaces. Um, you know, we, a lot of it goes through urban areas like up here, you see the east span of the Bay Bridge. Uh, up on the left, on the lower right, you see the promenade on Embarcadero in San Francisco. Next. 
to rural areas, uh, which is a little bit more like where this project is located. Uh, on the upper left, you see a boardwalk for the trail over in the Alviso. On the lower right is a shot from the trail at Eden Landing in Hayward. Next. And of course, what I'm calling suburban, but that's not really the, the most encompassing name, is that there's everything in between those type of rural and, and urban spaces uh, don't can't be captured that you need to deal with. On the upper left is uh, Alameda on Bay Farm Island, and that's Caesar Chavez Park over in Berkeley on the lower right. Next. I'm just going to go through some really quickly some basic uh, design concepts that we always think of with the Bay Trail. Um, one of them is lighting. Typically, it's for safety and also trail access. But we also need to think about ambient light impacts. And I'll talk about this more later. That's going to be very important when you're talking about compatibility with wildlife. Next. And we also want to talk about wayfinding signage, uh, which is important since it goes through so many different jurisdictions. We need to be able to let people know where they are continuing onward. It's not actually shown here because I don't, I didn't have a photo to really show it. But uh, in these types of wild areas, we want to minimize uh, both signs in terms of the number and also its intrusiveness. In this type of space, we would probably use, uh, again, a, a, a type of sign that's not shown here, which would typically be one of those more rustic low posts, no long higher than three feet high, uh, three inch circumference type of trail signs. Next. Uh, I won't go through this again. I'll just uh, over emphasizing the idea that connectivity is uh, so critical. Uh, we've had some designs in the past where uh, people design public access, but they put a gate there. The lower one on the uh, lower photos is uh, two trails where there were two projects that were developed separately where they forgot to uh, connect them because of the grade differential. We had to create a third project to uh, deal with that, that grade separation. So just over emphasizing the idea that connectivity is critical to the vision of the Bay Trail. Next. And of course, sea level rise again. Next. That picture there is uh, South San Francisco. So you can see that it's already impact today during King Tide events. So getting into the details of the compatibility with wildlife, th these are some of the objectives. I, I won't go into uh, the specific details of what you, each one of those bullet points say, but in the great sense of it, it's about trying to develop a Bay Trail that minimizes impacts to both the vegetation and habitat as well as the wildlife that lives within the, the habitat and vegetative areas, minimizing erosion uh, at the same time, and also minimizing light impacts. But also uh, with a point that I think Lisa made earlier is that we also wanna ensure that in these spaces, we provide educational and interpretive opportunities to discuss the value of these type of habitat spaces and restoration projects. Next. So here are some of the design elements that we have put in there. And again, this, this is, these design elements aren't going to be a fit for every single uh, type of restoration project uh, and habitat project that has public access with it. It's really about creating um, a palette of ideas and to generate thinking for designers as they're working on design for these types of spaces. Um, one of the first things, of course, that we need to think about is alignment. Um, what alignment does make sense. We want to stay away from extremely sensitive habitat areas. We want to have the alignment designed in a way where it won't create intrusion by people. We also need to think about parking and staging. Uh, we all know that you get the highest use of trails nearest to staging and parking areas. So in sensitive habitat areas, we need to think about placement of parking and staging areas so that maybe it's further away from the most sensitive areas so that it minimizes the impacts of folks going through that space. Uh, again, the idea of education interpretive science is critical. Uh, observation points. You know, when you do start restricting people's access into these spaces, they do want to go there because they are interested in seeing natural areas and potentially having the opportunity to see some wildlife in that space. So you have to create um, designated spaces for people that they want to go to that will actually give them that experience that they're looking for. So that there needs to be some thought into that when you're designing these types of projects. We also want to think about 
uh, minimizing uh, objects or, or designs that create perching opportunities for predation by raptors on a sensitive type of, um, uh, of animals and endangered species like the salt marsh harvest mice. Um, so you typically want to avoid anything that are tall signs and you also want to create um, a diameter or railing that's uh, of railing and, and other type of things that are not conducive to perching by the by the raptors and, and um, other predators. With lighting, um, we talked about this earlier. We really want to think about does that space really need to be lighting? Can it be turned in a different space if we absolutely need lighting? But in really natural spaces where there's sensitive habitat, we might get to the point where lighting is completely inappropriate in that space, and we want to stay away from that. And of course, we want to talk about physical and visual separation. And there's uh, several concepts that we throw out there. One is that if it's absolutely necessary to create habitat access control fencing, which is just fencing that separates the public access from the habitat while creating a fence that isn't so high uh, that it restricts movement by wildlife, but also creates some space at the bottom to allow some travel of um, wildlife through that space as well. Next slide. And in terms of other buffers, much like this um, space that we're talking about today for the horizontal levee, you can provide uh, open space buffers through upland buffer spaces or other types of design. Um, ex in extreme cases, you can create moats. Uh, wetlands are also natural barriers, I think, and buffers that keep people out of those spaces. People tend not to walk in that. Most people, I should say, tend to not want to walk in wetlands. Sometimes they, they do, and we, we hope to design it in a way that keeps them out. And there's also, of course, the natural vegetative design uh, instead of using uh, fencing to create buffers as well. Next slide. So I wanted to give you some examples of existing um, designs in wildlife spaces with the Bay Trail. This is probably one of the most extreme designs that, that we have out there. This is at uh, Eden Shores, which separates a um, large um, uh, subdivision over at Hay the city of Hayward from the habitat and wetland area over at Eden Landing. Uh, what you're seeing on the top left photo is actually a bridge uh, with a, uh, two doors essentially that keeps hopefully uh, pets like cats and uh, dogs from getting through to the, the habitat space itself. Uh, the lower right gives you a different perspective of it and you can also see that a moat was created to create that separation as well. Um, I didn't have a photo of it, but on some of the fence railing here, you do see these large um, diameter drums that are put on top of the fences to kind of prevent raptors from being able to land on them. Next. This is over at um, the upper right photo is at Ravenswood. Uh, this is a good example of observation area that was created at a natural space that people want to look at pretty views, um, get a water experience, and also potential to be able to see some wildlife, along with some interpretive signage to talk about the value of um, habitat restoration work and endangered species. Uh, the same similar type of concept over on the lower left over at Eden Landing in Hayward. Next. This is over at Ravenswood, um, over on the peninsula. On the upper photo, it's another good example of observation deck with interpretive signage. On the lower uh, photo, you can see that it was a boardwalk, uh, which boardwalks are one of the solutions to be able to um, create a trail through spaces where um, the habitat allows that to occur. Um, and also you can create it in a way though that it allows water and, and wildlife to continue to travel underneath the, the boardwalk. That's one of the primary points of creating boardwalk in these type of wetland spaces. Next. And this is a similar concept of a boardwalk over at a project in the north side of the city of Richmond at Dotson Family Marsh. This was a uh, part of the Bay Trail that was created as part of the uh, habitat restoration project that East Bay Regional Parks created. The trail is actually uh, on the furthest upland edges of the restoration site. This is in the upland area, but we wanted to be able to create a trail that allowed for 
water to flood into the upland area and also for refugia for some of the uh, wildlife in this area to be able to travel into drier areas in the upland space as well. This is probably one of the more uh, expensive and Cadillac versions of a boardwalk. As you can see, it's actually uh, got concrete paving on top of it. Next. And this is over at Hamilton, over in the Novato area, where there was a restoration project at the old Hamilton airfield. This is part of the Bay Trail. You can see on the lower uh, photo an example of uh, some wildlife protection railing and fencing. And again, on the upper left, another good example of an observation area with interpretive signage. What I really like about this one is it has uh, some of those uh, binoculars that uh, you can see this this uh, little boy here enjoying to see some of the views and hopefully some wildlife while they're out there. Next. And this is a project that's yet to come. That's part of the Eden Landing Phase 2 project near Union City and Hayward, uh, part of the South Bay Salt Pond project. It's a little hard to see in this photo, but the purple alignment that you see that extends from the upper part of the, the map and travels down to the middle of the map on the lower side shows the future alignment of the Bay Trail. As you can see, with a lot of uh, work and planning and cooperation with uh, some of the stakeholders in the area, the Bay Trail was designed to primarily stay out of the most sensitive habitat in the northern space and in the less sensitive spaces to give people an opportunity to kind of really experience the restored salt ponds. The Bay Trail is able to travel a little bit into the salt ponds there. Next. And with that, I just wanted to end my uh, presentation with uh, some ideas I think that are important in terms of achieving successful wildlife compatible public access. One is that um, every project and every area has very specific issues and therefore has very specific solutions. The way to get to that is to work through and work together with all the different stakeholders to get to the collaborative solutions that achieve these multi-objective goals or multi-benefit goals that we have. And this photo here is one of those good examples of a Pinole Shores Bridge over near the city of Pinole, which was a very expensive bridge, unfortunately, but it solved a lot of problems in being able to have the Bay Trail in a space that actually is on a bluff and needed to land closer to sea level while crossing a Union Pacific Railroad while avoiding some existing wetland areas. Next. And with that, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see if there's a question and hopefully we have a little bit of time to move on to everyone else. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, so we are running a little bit behind schedule, but uh, we do have one question that's been submitted specifically for you to um, answer. So if we can, we'll carve out a little bit of time for that. Um, so the question is, um, what's the advisability of climbing the berm trail or essentially having the trail on top of the berm in this small segment of horizontal levee? I think the question is um, geared more towards any negative edge effects expected from that. Yeah, well, I'm not as familiar with this project as I should be, but as I understand, this project is actually going to be improvement of where the existing trail alignment is, since the existing trail alignment actually bifurcates the, the, the uh, habitat area. It'll actually be moving the trail further closer or uh, further away from the habitat, creating some uh, upland space for retreat, essentially. So to me, uh, from a public access and a wildlife perspective, I think this is one of those examples where you do get multi-benefits, where you get to maintain the trail, uh, Bay Trail, you get to maintain the connectivity of the Bay Trail while being able to retreat and reduce the existing um, impacts that the trail already has on this space. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Lee. All right. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Lynn Trulio is a professor in the Department of Environmental Studies at San Jose State University. Her research investigates human impacts to species and habitats, especially in urban settings. Her two primary research programs have focused on public access impacts to wildlife, as well as the ecology and preservation of the Western burrowing owl in California. She has published numerous papers on both topics. In addition to her professorship, Dr. Trulio has been the department chair, <clears throat> excuse me, the department chair for a total of 15 years, 
She was the lead scientist for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project, directing the project's science program during its planning phase from 2003 to 2008, and again from 2018 to 2020. Dr. Trulio received her PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis, and her undergraduate degree in biology from Gosher College in Towson, Maryland. Welcome, Dr. Trulio. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you everybody for being here um, to uh, hear, hear our, our talks today. And so um, thank you, Lee, for that, that perspective from the Bay Trail. Um, so uh, now, uh, and also um, the other speakers uh, and Peter Bay and, and Lisa for providing some great, great background um, on the ecology and, and the uh, recreational use of the area. Today, I'm gonna give you a, um, a review of uh, sort of what we know about the extent to which wetland species and trail users or public access uh, writ large uh, can coexist. Uh, next slide. So public access and wildlife protection, as you have been hearing, um, is a, um, uh, it, th these are typically dual goals of, um, <clears throat> these are typically dual goals of, of, of conservation and, um, you know, projects such as the one you're hearing about today. Um, is also a dual goal, for instance, of the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project, which is the largest wetland restoration project on the West Coast and the second largest in the US, by the way. Um, so, uh, and, the, and the fact is um, the demand um, for public access and for wildlife protection um, is the demand and the need are, are growing for both of them. Um, <clears throat> there, you know, there's um, the actual, the growth of, of public access um, in numbers is, is, is really tremendous. Um, uh, in, in, uh, in with respect to number of visitors and a uh, number of days that the public is going out to, to natural and wild places. The public access is, is definitely, the, the, is definitely growing the amount of it. Uh, okay, next slide. All right, so um, I did, a, I've, I have been working on, I've been doing research on this topic for many years and I actually wanna thank the Bay Trail for getting we started on this topic. Um, I did a project uh, many years ago, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, um, that started me on my research on public access and wildlife. So here I give you a little bit of a, a literature review on what we know about the uh, compatibility of public access and wildlife. So first of all, there's a really large body of knowledge in the, in the peer-reviewed literature on uh, public access and wildlife and the compatibility. Um, and you can see from this graph that actually, you know, starting back in um, the 80s and 90s, and when I started on this, on this um, research area, there wasn't a lot published, but you can see that the publication rate on this topic has been going up very, very rapidly. And that's because it is such an important topic for uh, the protection of wildlife uh, worldwide. Um, it's, um, you know, the, the number of visitors uh, going to wild places, as I mentioned, has just been growing exponentially. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, so what do we know? There are some aspects of this question about public access and wildlife compatibility that we know pretty well. First of all, we know that nesting species are very sensitive to trail users and other type of approach. So we should never have public access near nesting species. They're extremely sensitive. And some of the first original research on this topic was as a result of researchers going into nesting colonies and, and the disturbance caused by researchers. So researchers can be a huge disturbance factor. Direct approach to species is more disturbing than tangential approach. So going sideways is better than approaching directly. Loud and fast movement is more disruptive than quiet and slower movement, as you might expect, but perhaps um, somewhat counterintuitively, uh, counterintuitive to what people think, pedestrians are often more disruptive than uh, vehicles to wildlife. Dogs disturb wildlife. <laughs> 
newsflash. <laughs> but yet there's a lot of quite people have a lot of questions about dogs, dogs disturb wildlife and the, the literature on dogs is, has been growing. Um, and as as Lee mentioned, you know, with respect to um, public access, the fact is that um, the responses by wildlife to public access vary due to a number of factors, the species, the recreation type, location, time of the year, even the individual personalities and experiences of the wildlife themselves and other factors. And uh, so, um, and there's a great deal of literature on, on the variation in wildlife responses. Next slide, please. And I want you to do this, uh, you know, Mitchell, why do pedestrians scare wildlife so much? Well, the fact is, we as pedestrians, we as walkers and hikers are viewed as predators. We have two eyes looking forward and to most of the species that we're looking at, which are prey species, they view us as predators. So there's a great fear response when we turn and we look directly at wildlife. Um, and there are some ways to reduce this impact, uh, distance and barriers, for example, and I'll talk more about distance as we go along. Okay, next slide. Something else we know, <laughs> recreationists, recreationists typically do not think they are having a negative impact or harming species. They don't, and I have run across this throughout my years of doing this research. They don't believe they're having an impact, even though they may very well be having an impact. In addition, they tend to think that other recreationists are having a bigger impact than they are. So it's like, no, it's those people over there. So um, <laughs> this is very, very good literature on the human side of the public access and wildlife um, disturbance question. And one of the reasons there is so much disturbance is that recreationists don't think they're having an impact when they very likely are. Okay, next slide. Okay, that said, um, we do have a big literature, a fair amount of it is known, but there's a lot that is not known. And wetlands in particular have not received much research attention. So here's a percent of articles by habitat type from Larson et al. And you can see that, you know, 25 articles or, you know, some like under 10% were about, about wetlands. And so um, this is a, a habitat area that needs more research. Next slide. As a result of the fact that that South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project has public access and wildlife protection as key goals, um, and the fact that not much is known about where there's not a big literature on impacts on wetland species, the South Bay Salt Pond uh, Restoration Project um, had um, my colleagues and I do a number of research projects on this topic to provide data for managers, especially with respect to trails. Next slide, please. This all pond project, as I mentioned, has, has a, a bunch of goals, um, but key are um, ecological objectives, in particular, protecting species diversity and abundance. Excuse me as well as sensitive species such as the Western Snowy Plover and Ridgeways Rails, um, but also providing public access, meaningful, um, valuable public access so that the public loves these areas. And, you know, restoration needs to be funded. And so, you know, it's important that people are able to see these beautiful natural areas. But how do we balance these two objectives? Okay, next slide. So we, my, my research colleagues and I did a number of studies, um, including uh, studies done by some of my, my graduate students. And I'm gonna talk about the top three today, uh, trails and nesting snowy plovers, shorebirds and waterfowl. Um, and then my grad student, um, I had two grad students who did theses on boats and harbor seals, which um, also was about public access. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so I mentioned that nesting species, we know nesting species are very sensitive to um, 
to, to approach. And um, we have an important, very important nesting snowy plover population in the South Bay Salt Pond uh, restoration project footprint. Um, Lee showed the bay trail over in the Eden Landing area, which goes at the back side of most of the wetlands. And that trail is in it is actually in a, in a pretty good location to avoid nesting snowy plovers, which um, it, that is really the stronghold of nesting snowy plovers in the salt pond project area, although they do nest in other areas. Um, the project managers wanted specific information on flush rates and distances um, and the response to different trail users. And we also looked at direct and tangential approach. And next slide. So with the South Bay Salt, uh, sorry, with um, San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, in particular, um, Caitlin Nielsen Robinson, um, who was one of my grad students and worked with, worked at SFBBO, uh, we undertook a study, uh, they, they study the, the, the nesting snowy plovers um, in the Salt Pond Project, and still do, by the way, to ensure, um, to try to ensure population growth and protection. And um, we wanted to, so you, working with them, we did some researcher approaches, um, trail walkers, which are walk tangentially to the plovers, the researchers approach directly, the walkers tangential, and then we had control where we observed nests that had no walkers approaching. And as you can see, um, researchers flushed uh, birds off of their nest as they approached 84% of the time that they approached. Trail walkers, 59% of the time. So it was less, but it was pretty, pretty significant. And when there was no approach, birds flushed off their nest, you know, sort of just naturally, background rate, only 11% of the time. So we can see that walkers and researchers had a significant impact on flushing birds off of their nest, which is a very, uh, very bad thing to have happen because it exposes the nest to predators. Um, also not being kept warm, all kinds of, you know, um, negative problems. Um, the average flush dis distance was approximately 145 meters, 145 meters. So, um, and the flush rate went up very quickly as walkers approached that, that 145, 150 meter um, uh, mark. So further away, um, you know, wasn't really wasn't much of a problem at all. But then as you reached about 150 meters, birds started flushing. Okay, so that's what we found out about snowy plovers. Uh, management implications, um, place new trails at least 150 meters away from nesting snowy plovers and close existing trails uh, that are less than 150 meters from nesting snowy, snowy plovers during the nesting season. And in fact, the Salt Pond Project has used these management recommendations to manage for snowy plovers in the Eden Landing area. So, um, and the whole goal of our research was to provide information that could be used for management and protection of wildlife. And Cell Pond Project has been extremely good at using our results. Okay, next slide. Um, and I show you these, I show you this information because it's very specific to our region, very specific to wetlands, and so it has, has um, direct implication for you know, projects around the bay. Uh, we looked at trails and shorebirds, and shorebirds, um, most of them are here in the wintertime. So these are wintering birds that are not breeding here. They're here, um, you know, fueling up for the winter and um, and they, they will spend some time here. And, and so, so this is their winter habitat. And then in the spring, they, they fly north um, to, to breed in their breeding areas. We wanted to find out, and this is the first study actually that, that um, I did with my colleagues. Um, we published this, this research in the Journal of Wildlife Management and the Bay Trail asked us to do this work. They wanted to know, you know are trail workers, uh, walkers flushing the birds, you know, is it a negative impact? So we looked at three paired trail and non-trail sites, in other words, places where there were trail walkers, not trail work walkers, and we wanted to see the impact of trail use on the number of birds, the species richness, and there's the diversity of species, and the percent of time birds spent foraging. Okay, next slide. 
Now we found that um, the number of birds did decline on weekend days, which are very, very high trail use days versus week, week days, lower trail use. But it was a very small decline, actually. It was, it was significant, but it was really small. We did find that there was no, no appreciable reduction in bird numbers or bird diversity or the proportion of birds foraging at trail versus non-trail sites. So we found these little shorebirds, we're talking about these little peats, right? These little guys really didn't seem to care that much about trail walkers. And these were trail walkers within 30 to you know, 50, you know, some like 30 to 50 meters, you know, very close, very close to the birds. Um, next slide. So, so really what we found was that the factors involved in the lack of um, concern <laughs> and lack of, lack of response of the birds uh, to trail walkers probably involved a few factors, the tangential nature of trails, small birds. By the way, small birds will flush at a shorter distance than larger birds because it takes larger birds longer to get off the ground. So they need more space. So they're, they flush at greater distances from people. It was non-urbanized and, no, sorry, non-motorized and in an urbanized area. So these trail use under these conditions seem to have little effect on the, the very proximate behavioral responses of birds. We don't know if there were physiological responses over time, but um, because we, there are a lot of unknowns um, still, um, we recommended that um, the, the salt pond project plan for substantial no access areas so that there's plenty of habitat for these sh small shore birds to access foraging areas without trail use. Okay, next slide. So then we wanted to know about wintering waterfowl, in other words, ducks. Um, again, most of the ducks that we have here, especially in the South Bay is a hugely ducky area. Oh my gosh, there are so many ducks down here, especially these guys, uh, these Northern shovelers. Um, so they come here in the winter time um, approximately a quarter million of them. And we have a bit of, about a million um, shorebirds, by the way, that come to the Bay Area. About a quarter million ducks, a lot of them come to the South Bay. We want to know how they responded to trail use in the winter. So foraging, no, no, not ready yet. Did you go back? Thank you. Um, foraging um, in the winter time. So we looked at the response of ducks um, at salt ponds in the South Bay area. And what we did was we counted ducks in the ponds in 40 meter bands. You can see going out from the levee. Here's the levee on the right. And we counted ducks in 40 meter bands going out from the levee. We counted the ducks by species before we took a walk. Then we took a walk to trail walkers. So this was an experimental approach to trail walkers. And then we counted the ducks after we took a walk. And we had we did this at trail and non-trail sites. Okay, thank you, next slide. Um, so at non-trail sites, in other words, places where the birds did not experience trail walkers, okay? We found that there was a very significant effect on the number of birds as far out as 150 meters. So there were fewer birds before versus after our walks um, about, all the way out to about 150 meters. So that's quite a long distance. Um, at trail sites where there was already activity, um, we found that there was a significant difference before versus after in the closest band, but not in the further away bands. And, you know, this is probably an indication that because these are trail sites, a bunch of ducks have already left. They just aren't using this area, whereas, you know, maybe they're over here where there's no trail. So we did see an impact here um, and a little bit of an impact, maybe out to 80 meters, but probably because there's trail use, there may already be fewer ducks. But more importantly, next slide. Here is the average distance of the closest individuals of different species. So we found that ruddy ducks, um, when there was a, a trail, so this is during trail use. Um, the, the they, you know, they average maybe about 50, about 100 meters, and then scalps 
went out to, you know, maybe about, you know, the closest about 130 and then canvas backs out there at 140 meters. So again, we're seeing ducks staying quite a long distance away from trail walkers. So unlike the, the little peeps, ducks care a lot. They actually don't really like trails very much. And a couple of reasons, they're much bigger so than shorebirds. So it takes them a while to get off the, off the water. Also, they're hunted and, you know, this is not lost on them. So, you know, and they, they you know, that's a big factor. Um, and so next slide, um, our management recommendations were really that if you're going to have a trail next to a pond, the ha habitat disturbance zone is 100 to 160 meters. In other words, that band of pond is not going to be used by most of your ducks. So you're excluding ducks from a pretty wide band of habitat. If you're going to have a trail located next to a large pond to allow birds to escape the trail use and have a lot of pond habitat to use, but especially for ducks, plan for significant areas without trails. And one thing we also found is the ducks did not habituate to trail use. We thought they might get used to trail walkers, but they don't. They don't get used to trail walkers and I can go into detail on why, but you know, they don't. Um, we also recommended that the salt pond project plan for, um, for, for um, locating um, public access in a small, a small high quality footprint. <laughs> because when you have public access, you're gonna have fewer ducks and probably fewer other, other species too. So we want people to have a good public access experience, but don't spread it out all over the place. Concentrate it in a place where people want to be, where they can see the wildlife and see the marsh, but then leaving lots of area um, free of public access for um, species diversity and protection. Next slide. Some questions for future studies. Some things we don't know. We don't know how Ridgeways rails or salt marsh harvest mice respond to trail use. Don't know. Um, don't know how brackish marsh species respond. Um, and we don't really know how local trail users view their impact on wildlife. So we might want to know more about um, the public side. We have actually done some public access research you know, with people, um, but the fact that people don't think they're a problem indicates that we probably need more education on that, on that aspect. Okay, next slide. So can water birds and trails coexist public access? Um, yeah, we need careful study and management, um, providing adequate buffer distances, understanding species tolerances and public behavior. Uh, and people's public behavior and providing, um, um, you know, significant areas of habitat that where they, where, where species do not have to experience recreational impacts. Next slide. Okay, I want to thank my collaborators and my, on my research collaborators and site permission from a number of places who allowed us to do research. Um, next slide. Um, and funders and supporters. And so thank you, thank you very much. And I have a list of my citations if anybody is interested. Okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you. All right, we're really, really on the home stretch now and running out of um, time quickly. And I wanna make sure that we have sufficient time for our next presenter. Thank you so much, Dr. Trulio. Um, any questions, please submit them in the Q&A and Dr. Trulio will be able to answer them um, during the next session as well. All right, so at this point, I'd like to uh, present our, or introduce our final presenter for today, uh, Mr. Philip Higgins. Philip is the Wildlife Preservation Coordinator with the City of Mountain View and is based at Shoreline Park. Philip specializes in the conservation and research of burrowing burrowing owls and has 21 years of experience focusing on the species and other protected species residing and nesting at Shoreline Park. Prior to working for the city of Mountain View, Philip was a lecturer at San Jose State University, De Anza College, and Mission College. Outside of his regular work, Philip is conducting research on the diet, seasonal movements, site fidelity, breeding success, relocation, and captive breeding of burrowing owls. Please welcome Philip. And Philip, Hello, at this good time, morning, everybody. 
Hi, can you put on your video as well, please? Okay. Okay, hello and good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna focus my presentation on some of the impacts we've experienced at Shoreline Park, uh, just, which is just adjacent to Palo Alto over the past uh, 16 years that I've been working here. So some of the species I'm gonna focus on, the photographs are on the um, screen there. On the left-hand corner are black skimmers. So black skimmers nest in sandy areas, sandy beaches or islands. Unfortunately, we don't have um, any prime sandy areas um, in our uh, shoreline park, but they are nesting on the shoreline sailing lake island. Um, another species is burrowing owls. And unfortunately, this species has been declining significantly throughout its range, and especially in California and Santa Clara County. In the 1980s, we had about 500 burrowing owls at 250 locations. In 2014, we were down to just 116 adults. And this year, we were down to just 36 uh, adults at four breeding locations. And then on the right-hand side, we have a juvenile white-tail kite. Um, they started breeding within shoreline over the past four years. So next slide. So we're actually very fortunate uh, to be living in California. It's supposedly one of the 34 biodiversity hotspots on the planet. A lot of this uh, biodiversity occurred because of geographical isolation. So of the 6,000 plant species, one third are endemic or found nowhere else. And of the 1,000 vertebrates, 65 are endemic. And you actually saw some photographs earlier on of uh, Ridgeways rails and salt marsh harvest mice, which are both endemic to San Francisco Bay. Next slide, please. Um, and Lynn mentioned earlier on that we can have up to 1 million water birds um, in the San Francisco Bay. So we're actually located on the Pacific Flyway. So twice per year, birds migrate from Central and South America up to the Arctic regions to reproduce. They stop off the San Francisco Bay to refuel. Some remain to breed, and then they migrate back down south in the fall. So we do have a great amount of biodiversity. If you look at the picture there of the bay, you can see in the South Bay, the green areas, they're surrounded by a lot of urban development. And what's happening is most of these upland areas, they're getting more and more fragmented. And just studying burrowing owls over the past few years, we've seen more and more increases in predation, especially from raptors. We're forcing more and more predators of burrowing owls and other species to be confined in smaller and smaller areas. And then all the species in these fragmented areas are also competing against each other in one way or another for nesting spots and more importantly also for prey items. Next slide. Um, so you can see a shoreline uh, in the left, the left of Moffat and just south of Bixby Park. So even a small area like Shoreline Park, which is only 500 acres, we have over 20 protected species, uh, mostly birds residing there. And Charleston Slough, which is in between Bixby Park and Shoreline Park, we do four surveys per year at that site. And we've observed over 27,000 birds representing 43 different species, just in one survey. We do one survey at low tide, one at high tide. So great diversity, in just a small little area. And then, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but Shorebird Way, which is just south of Shoreline Park, it has the largest egret rookery in the South San Francisco Bay. So some years we've had up to 40 great egret nests and 21 snowy egret nests. And just over the last few years, we've also had black crown night herons. And this year we had a pair of white-tailed kites and two years ago, a pair of red-shouldered hawks. So even urban areas can provide a lot of uh, habitat for species. And what we're seeing, more and more is some of these species have to adapt or else they're just going to go extirpated in these areas. And as I mentioned already, burrowing owls were down to just four breeding locations in the entire Santa Clara County. And Shoreline is one of those locations. Unfortunately, Shoreline is a closed landfill. So there's a lot of issues with trash decomposition and ground subsidence. We're continually doing cap repairs, which destroys habitat. We do restore that habitat, but based on the frequency of habitat description, it is causing an impact on burrowing owls. Then we have San Jose Airport, Moffat Airfield, two uh, airfields which 
don't necessarily want large flocks of birds because of collisions with aircraft. And then the last breeding site for burrowing owls is Alviso, at the Water Pollution Control Plant. And that's actually located 13 feet below sea level. So seasonal flooding is a big issue there. Okay, next slide. So there are a lot of regulations related to the protection of birds. We have the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act and California Department of Fish and Wildlife Codes 3503 uh, up to 3800. So they do forbid the destruction of birds' nests uh, and their eggs and even take of these individuals. And there is citations and imprisonment terms, terms if you are um, caught in the process of impacting some of these species. Next slide. But despite all those codes and regulations, we do have a lot of disturbance, and especially during the breeding season. It's a very, very sensitive time for nesting birds. First, they're constructing nets, then they're feeding young, which is increasing their um, amount of time out looking for prey items. Um, but I'm going to talk about some experiences that we've observed over the years um, at Shoreline. So, on the bottom left hand photograph, you can see a red bishop bird. It's a non-native bird. It's from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, two years ago, we had a pair uh, constructing a nest at Shoreline. And they're actually constructing it in the um, bulrush uh, reed area in the photograph on the left-hand side. So this little wetland area is only about 30 feet wide. And the male of this species is very vibrant coloration. So when it was first observed, it caused a lot of media attention. A lot of uh, sites start advertising the exact location, giving GPS coordinates and photographs of the bird's nesting location. And it is great for people to see a uh, species, even if it is a non-native species, uh, an exotic species, but it's a very uh, vibrant species. We got a lot of people out on a regular, on a daily basis, uh, trying to take photographs of uh, the birds. So we do encourage education, and education is a big role that the biologists play um, at Shoreline Park. But when you have up to 54 people um, on a daily basis uh, trying to get photographs of this little bird, it can cause a lot of disturbance. We put up some signs, educational signs, and temporary fencing to stop people um, climbing over the barriers and going right over to the nest. And what would happen was, um, People would go as close to the nest as possible. The bird would flush to the west of the site, about 20 or 30 feet. Uh, 30 to 40 people would follow the bird over to the west. The bird would return to the nest. All the people would move back again. This was happening day in, day out. Eventually, these birds, this pair of birds, actually abandoned the nest. The following year, they moved to Stevens Creek, and we had the same issue again. Um, vast amounts of people uh, trying to get a perfect photograph um, of this bird. But disturbing them during this time um, does cause nest abandonment. At the Stevens Creek location, we had several issues of individuals falling down the slope. It's a very steep embankment. And the birds abandoned that nest again. Photograph on the right-hand side, uh, the bottom right, is a pair of burrowing owls that bred in 2021 at Shoreline. And the photograph above that shows birders around temporary fences. So initially, we put up a snow fence around uh, the burrowing owl pair. Um, same thing again, we got a lot of uh, social media attention. Um, people would come, and the major I want to emphasize, the majority of people are very cautious and do abide by the buffer zones and do not disturb the birds. But it only takes a couple of individuals each day on a regular basis where you have nest abandonment. We actually had to put up four temporary fences at this site uh, to keep people out from disturbing uh, the burrowing owls at this location. Next slide. So we do a lot of education, as I mentioned already, using educational signage. And we, as was mentioned earlier on with Lee, we also have viewing decks to allow people to get into some of these areas to see wildlife up close um, as possible. And as I already mentioned, signage and viewing decks are beneficial. It's great to have people out there and they work for the vast majority of people. Next slide. We also have over 2,000 volunteers come out to Shoreline um, every year to remove invasive weeds, to build artificial burrows, to install nest boxes. 
And as part of all those work days, we always do an in-depth educational component to educate volunteers and the community about the impacts. It's great to do these habitat enhancements, but it's also important, especially during the breeding season, to avoid disturbance and to avoid nest abandonment uh, for a lot of these species. Next slide. So often when we see more and more disturbance occurring at an area, we move to more restrictive signage. So the original signs were just educational, informing people about wildlife. Then we move to restrictive signage. And we've also started to install more permanent fencing, like the split rail wooden fence um, on the photograph on the right hand side. And again, the vast majority of people do stay on the right side of the fencing and do abide by the sensitive signs. Next slide. So here's an example of um, a few individuals. And I want to emphasize, this is only a minimum number of individuals do ignore the signage and the fences. So here you have two signs, nesting birds, stay back, and sensitive wildlife, do not disturb. And these four individuals are actually sitting down in a pickleweed area, which is a sensitive um, habitat area and could possibly be habitat for salt marsh harvest mice. Another issue for these individuals to get down there, they had to walk down a slope, um, which creates a trail. Then these trails get wider and wider, and then smaller trails connect up with these bigger trails. And after a while, more and more people use them. When they get used to using the trails, they often consider them to be a regular uh, trail as opposed to an unofficial trail. Another issue we've had on one or two occasions is individuals have moved out into the mudflats on the bay. And um, speaking from personal experience by rescuing birds, it, you go straight down. You can go uh, up to your waist within a couple of seconds after stepping into those muddy areas. So it's not just a disturbance area, it's also a safety and liability issue with people going into these sensitive areas. Next slide, please. Um, here's a couple of fences that we put up for burrowing owls. Um, even with signs, we found that with temporary fencing, we have to go out uh, two or three times per week and repair the fences. We try to try different types of of fences, um, just using stakes, caution tape, using snow fences, that's orange snow fencing on the right hand side, um, using wire fences, and then moving over to the split rail wooden fences. Next slide. So one thing we've learned is um, using fencing with native plants is a great way to deter people, especially if the plants are planted in dense uh, volumes. So the photograph on the right hand side, it has California native rose and toyon behind the split rail wooden fence. Initially, we only had the wooden fence. Some individuals, and not all, were climbing over the fence. But when we put in the dense planting of plants, that deterred most people um, getting into the area. Um, also, these hedgerows provide a great, great amount of habitat and also nesting species for other, other individuals. Another liability issue is people going onto the golf course. So we've tried to put up signs saying no public access. Um, I've seen what happens to individuals if you do get hit by a golf ball. And I'm always amazed at the amount of people who bring kids onto the cart paths or cycle or even skateboard on the cart paths around the golf course. I can understand why they're doing it. You have a lovely landscaped area, you have a flat uh, cart path, but it is very, very dangerous. Next slide. So in the end, for the burrowing owls, we had to move to a six foot tall chain link fence to stop disturbance. Remember, we're only down to four individual breeding sites. Um, a shoreline for the past five to six years, we've only had two to three burrowing owl, owls during the breeding season. So even the loss or disturbance in reproduction of one individual can, can significantly impact our population. So we started off with signage, educational signage, it worked for most people. We moved to temporary fencing. Then we moved to split rail wooden fences. We tried native plants. The only way we could stop the disturbance on a regular basis was to put in the um, six foot tall chain link fence. Next slide. So Lynn also mentioned um, boating and its impacts on uh, nesting birds. So here's the shoreline Sailing Lake Island. 
So this is, we don't have many islands in the South San Francisco Bay Area. We've actually lost one of our islands in Charleston Slough and another island has been completely eroded on um, Pond A1. So this island here inside the Shoreline Sailing Lake is one of the biggest islands we have in, in the area. And it's a very important nesting area for black skimmers, Foster's terns, American avocets, black neck stilts, Canada geese and mallards. In the summertime, we have a lot of boaters using the shoreline sailing lake. And we had a lot of disturbance um, from boaters. They weren't intentionally going onto the island. I think with the winds was blowing them over and they often got off, got onto the island. And once they step onto that island or even within um, a certain distance of the island, most of the birds are flushing on the island. So black skimmers are actually a protected species. They're listed as a state species of special concern. In 2013, they started breeding on the island, but they weren't successful. Then in 2014, 2015, we started doing a lot of habitat enhancement on the island. Then we put up buoys around the island and educational signage to discourage boaters from first approaching the island, then from stepping onto the island. Unfortunately, the buoys didn't work. Boaters would, some boaters would go in and out of the buoys and still go onto the island. So this year, 2021, the area in red, we closed off the entire area to boating, including the channel between um, the golf course and the Sailing Lake Island. We had the best uh, breeding success um, in 21 years of monitoring that island. Uh, black skimmers, we had 119 adults up from two over the past five years, and we had 41 chicks. Foster's terns, 145 adults, 27 chicks. Prior to 2021, we never had one um, surviving chick fledge. So the issue, when people go onto the island and flush the birds off the island, the eggs and the chicks are actually exposed to predators and also from the heat of the sun. So we've done a, a short study, small study on the island, and we found that the island was being disturbed 12 times per day. And the birds were uh, being flushed off for a total of 30, 39 minutes per day. So eggs and even chicks can die from heat exposure during that time period. So just removing the disturbance caused a huge increase in breeding success. Next slide. So just to sum up, um, human disturbance can cause nest abandonment. We've seen a lot of examples um, of it at Shoreline. Um, it is great to have people out of Shoreline and to see wildlife. Um, we do a lot of educational um, component um, here at Shoreline between volunteers to show them some of the nesting birds. Some bird species can tolerate a high level of disturbance, but not when it's on a regular time frame, and especially during the breeding season when it's especially uh, sensitive for some of these species. Another example, the white-tailed kites. We had to put a snow fence around their, their nest because we had birders were there from six to eight hours a day and one individual was there for, who told us he was there for four hours. And he said the bird was sitting on the nest the entire four hours and it was a waste of his time. So he picked up a rock and threw it at the tree to flush the bird off the nest just to get one photograph. Um, one individual is not a big ordeal, but when it's multiple individuals over a long period of time, it can cause nest abandonment. And we have observed that on several occasions at Shoreline. So we usually start off with educational signage, then low impact fencing, and then for at least for the burrowing owls, we had to go to a six foot tall a chain link fence just to disturb uh, the disturbance for these nesting birds. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you so much. I feel like that was a lot of uh, great examples of adaptive management. Uh, so we're a little bit over time and I apologize. And I want to thank everybody who has stuck with us, um, especially since this is most likely um, part of your lunch break. So we do appreciate it. We hope that you learned um, as much as we have throughout uh, putting this presentation together and also hearing from the other presenters today. Um, we're gonna skip our last icebreaker because I wanna be mindful and respectful of everybody's uh, time. 
Um, but I would like to first thank uh, the project team and all of the presenters today for putting this together and um, sharing all the great information that you've learned um, elsewhere. Um, and we'd like to thank all of the audience for joining us today. And if you have any questions after the fact, please feel free to reach out to uh, myself or anybody on the project team. And with that, I'd like to end the webinar and, and say thank you one last time. So thank you.